in Colorado just sent me a snap. It's negative two degrees. Yeah. Right now. Negative two degrees. Negative two degrees. Can you? I can understand. U.S. system. You know, can you stop it? As I like. Yeah. Not Calvin. <laughs> Santa <laughs> Grace. <laughs> Santa <laughs> Grace. It's minus seven degrees. Yeah. That's yeah, fine. Negative eight, negative eight degrees. <laughs> I saw minus twenty. Where? Yeah. In Turkey. No, in Turkey. Minus twenty. Yep. Yeah. Minus twenty. Twenty-five or twenty-six. Yeah. Yeah, it, the, when you opened the door, it was covered with snow, so you were digging the snow to get out of the house. <laughs> Not in Istanbul, but the east part of Turkey. <laughs> it was funny, you know? Yeah, I don't like snow. <laughs> and you went to Europe, really? Yeah, I was, yeah and I was in Switzerland for four years. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we started. Hey, oh. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, but I think when you go to Sweden or Switzerland, especially the north, you lose your uh, cold feeling because you don't feel the cold when you come back. When you come back. I mean, here. Yeah, yeah, minus five centigrade or minus ten is nothing for you. You know, you. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you can survive. Yeah, but people start wearing some jacket and you're we're just looking around. With t shirt, you know? <laughs> nah, not doing my best try. I am. Okay, um, let's see. Two minutes for us. Uh, fine, we can start. So, um, today, let's see, I told you that we'll wrap up some loose ends, right? So, today, again, yeah, just, just a little bit of mathematics, and then we'll look at some concepts of battle of computing. Uh, which, when you do real things, practical things in CF, using CFT, this becomes a necessity. There is no way you can compute something uh, practically large on a laptop. So you have to go to very large machines. Okay. Um, so uh, before that, just let's take five to ten minutes to talk about polynomial theory. Um, okay, so filling is always a necessity when you're given real world data and there's some points that are missing that you want to know. For instance, here we might be given during the week, the first day, second day, third day, fifth day, sixth day, and seventh day have these temperatures, uh, average temperatures. And we don't know the temperature on the fourth day. Uh, and the question is, what is the temperature? Okay. So what would you do? You're given all these seven data points. What's the simplest thing you can do? What? You will plot it. Plot it, OK, fine. And you, even before that, you'll say, OK, three and five, take the average. OK? Yeah. But that's just using two data points instead of these seven. So fine, let's go make a plot. And when you plot the data, what will happen to you? You get these uh, plots, right? So that's for day one, the temperature, day two, temperature, three, five, six, and seven. So we make a plot, and then you can draw a straight line. Do you know what the straight line is? must be so linear least square is fixed. Right? Um, but somebody who likes mathematics very rigorously would say, I have six points. Why should I fit a straight line to it? I will fit a polynomial. What is the, the highest degree polynomial that you can fit with these six points? Six order, that's the six order. Um, what six degree? Six degree. So an x to the six, and everything below that. Yes. Okay. So let's see. Um, so with, if 
we have six data points, you're saying we can fit a 60 degree volume on it, I guess. So what, what do we have? A x to the six, right? Yes. And plus B x to the five, C x to the four. You want to change your answer? Not yet. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, e x squared plus f x. So one, two, three, four, five, six unknowns. Any missing? Yeah. Anything missing? Plus a constant, right? Plus a constant. Right? So with six data points, we cannot fit a sixth degree polynomial, but we can fit a fifth degree polynomial. Okay? So uh, six known values, which means we can solve for uh, six unknown coefficients. So what is your new answer? Five. Five, perfect. So we have uh, ax to the five plus bx to the four plus bx cubed squared plus bx. Yeah, so now with the, if I know the six xy pairs, I can find out what the a, b, c, d, e, f values should be. Should I do that with the data I showed you? Should we compute this? Nice fifth degree polynomial. We have the data and we have accurate mathematics. Why should we not do it? What is your answer? Should we do it? Should we not do it? We should do it. We should do it. Yes. Okay. Why? Just an example. Mathematically, it's possible, so we can do it. Right? All right. Mathematically, it's possible. So let's do it. Right. Perfect. So, so use the app. Fine. So yeah, this was a straight line. Let's say, okay, no, I want a fifth degree polynomial, which is what you said I should fit to it. So okay, now our curve, that's the polynomial, f of x, goes through all the points perfectly. But this is, this might not be the best thing to do. Okay. Because it's creating, this is called overfitting. It's trying to create information where information doesn't exist. For instance, do we really believe that at 1.5 day the temperature would be this value? Or it's more likely that it's something along the original straight line that we were seeing. So statistically, it's more likely that it follows this straight line pattern, right? There's this outlier. There was a very cold day with low temperature. But most of the other days seem to indicate uh, gradually so, yeah, this, you can do it mathematically, but it might not be the best thing to do. This is called polynomial overfit. Okay. Um, but for some instances, this is okay to do. So let's take a very a simpler example. Uh, if, we, if we are given uh, three data points, what can I fit to this now? So what's the function I can pick to this? Second degree polynomial, quadratic or curve. Right? So for that I would write uh, my uh, my curve will look like ax squared plus bx plus c. Now to find out what a, b, c are, I would write y1 equal a x1 squared plus b x1 plus c. Okay. Similarly, y2 is a. All right, and y3 is. Okay, so we have three equations and three unknowns. We can write this in matrix form. Uh, what would it look like in matrix form? Uh, okay, I'll let you tell me. So, what should I write? Y1, Y2, Y3. 
Uh, I will put the y on the other side, okay? So, all right, perfect. We have y1, y2, and y3. Okay, then, a, b, c. Where should a, b, c go? Here? No, I think the other. Yeah. So, here goes a, b, c. Okay? And in here, let's see, this is x1 squared, x1, and c. So, x1, ah, 1, sorry, sorry. So, a x1 squared plus b x1 plus c is equal to y1. Perfect. Okay, so now we have a matrix solution. Does this look familiar? It's just what we were doing yesterday, AX equals B, where this is unknown. Okay, now my X unknown vector is actually the ABCC. Make sense? And this, this special matrix is called a Van der Waals matrix. So anytime you have data and you want to interpolate in between. This is one way you can do it. You can fit a polynomial. This is called a Lagrange polynomial. Okay. Let me write that down here. So, so Lagrange polynomial. Okay. For the Lagrange polynomial, you just form the Van der Waals matrix. You don't need to write, uh, you know, 50 different equations. You know the form of the matrix would look something different, so you can basically construct it very easily. And then you can solve it. Yeah, but again, if you're worried about overfitting your data, as we saw on the screen, uh, you can switch to linear uh, least squares, okay? Uh, instead of fitting a high order, high degree polynomial, you fit a lower degree polynomial. And again, that's, uh, oops. But I, I won't go into the details of that, uh, but it's relatively simple. Uh, it tries to minimize the error. Uh, it, it basically tries to minimize the error in your linear fit from these data points. And that's how you compute this trade line. Okay, so that's some very basic things about polynomial theory. All right, so. Before we start talking about supercomputing and parallel computing, do you have questions about the project? No. All right, project is due tonight, uh, midnight. Uh, the submission is open till 6 a.m. tomorrow, but after that, it will close. You will not be able to submit. Um, okay, let's see about that. All right. Um, okay, fine. Um, so, what I showed you before was Lagrange interpolation. There's another type of interpolation called Hermite interpolation, where instead of using just the value, you can also use the derivative. Right? And here, you have four known values. So, you know the value here and the derivative here, value there, derivative here. So, you can fit up. What can you fit? Five or I mean, five. Five. Uh, you have four knowns, so then you can solve it for three. The third order. Yeah. So was the question here? No. I don't understand it. Okay. So if I give you four data points, you would fit a cubic, right? Mm -hmm. But now I only give you two data points, but I also tell you the derivative at those data points. What is the polynomial you can fit here? Second order, right? Because you take you have the derivatives, and when you have the derivative, it gives you first order equation. Uh, okay. So when you solve for unknowns, what's the thing you need? Number of unknowns has to be the number of, equal to the number of equations you have, right? Right. Yes. And that's what we were doing with this. This one here. We 
we have three known uh, values which gives me three equations. So I can solve for three unknowns, which is a second degree polynomial. Mm -hmm. Now the same question is, okay, I don't have these three points. I have two points. I know x, y, but I also know y prime. Right? You know the y prime at node left, y prime at node, node right. How many equations can you form? So we know with these two points, you can at least have two equations. Yeah. And I gave you additional information. Derivations, so we will have two linear equations. Okay, yeah, so we have two equations for the values itself, and two equations for the derivatives. So in total, we can form four equations. Yes. So we can solve for four unknowns. Mm -hmm. So we can fit up. Between these two points, we can fit a what? Cubic. Cubic. Yeah. We can solve for four unknown coefficients, so the best polynomial we can fit in between is a cube. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you can do this, uh, and uh, that's actually the polynomial that you see here. Uh, here, I knew the values phi one and phi two. I knew the derivatives. And as the derivative changes, your cubic fit in between changes. So this is called Hermite interpolation. Okay, so um, parallel computing. How many of you have had to deal with parallel computing? One, two, three, four, no. Okay, so um, if the concept is very simple. Uh, in the old days, you used to have one CPU on one computer, and that would handle all the computations. But nowadays, every computer has multiple of these CPUs. You've probably heard of multi-core CPUs. So this tiny laptop has four independent CPUs. Um, and what you can do is you can break up your task and into four parts and give each part to each individual CPU and they can work in parallel. So conceptually very simple. But implementing this is very, very different because you have to make sure that all of these independent parts work together and they're communicating with each other uh, and they don't, they basically need to keep exchanging data all the time. And if you do this inefficiently, if you give one part 50% of the work and the other remaining three the rest of the work, this is not efficient because everybody else will have to wait for the most loaded work. Okay. So there's many, many, many different issues. So let's just start with a <clears throat> brief introductory video from, uh, so this is a video made by the Department of Energy. This, this is their newest and fastest computer. I think this is the fastest on the planet at the moment, Summit, and uh, they created this. Thing. This is a supercomputer. And no, it's not just a PC with a cape and good intentions. Yes, it's an extremely powerful computer. But wait, what's a computer? A computer is a machine that takes in information, stores and processes it, and generates an output. Supercomputers do the same thing, but faster, with more data, and in a different way. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Personal computers from the 80s and 90s were serial processors. They performed operations one thing at a time, like checking things off a to-do list in an orderly fashion. PCs we have today, and even our smartphones, have made a lot of progress and can now perform multiple operations at a time. But for problems that are extremely complex, like simulating molecular behavior or modeling the Earth's climate, serial processing or even using a modern PC would take way too long. Supercomputers solve this problem by being able to perform many operations at once, in parallel. These kinds of computers have more processors and split problems into chunks, with each processor working on a different piece and all the processors working together at the same time. 
Want to hear a number that'll blow your mind? When you ask a supercomputer to work on a problem, it can be like asking a hundred million PCs to work on the problem. Now that is power. You can imagine that the kind of software that helps you tell your laptop what to do probably won't work when you're talking to a supercomputer. Supercomputing systems require scaled up software that organizes, assigns, stores, and processes data in the particular way that makes parallel computing possible. And some problems are easier to solve with parallel computing than others. Fun fact, problems that are really easy to split into chunks across a parallel computing network are called embarrassingly parallel problems. Something else to consider, running an immense number of processors requires an immense amount of power, both to run the computers and to cool them down. Just like your laptop has a fan in it to keep all its moving and electrical parts cool so it can continue to function optimally, computers on a much larger scale have to be kept cool too either by fan or by cooled water that flows through pipes throughout the computing building. So, supercomputers not only solve some of the world's toughest problems, but also present interesting software and hardware challenges for the world's most creative problem solvers. The new supercomputer being installed at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, called Sierra, will be one of the fastest in the world, and will be used to solve a diverse array of complex problems, like how to speed up discovery of new cancer drugs, and will help us ask questions the world needs answers to, all of which we'll cover in upcoming installments of this supercomputing series. Okay, so, all right. Summit is, I forget which national lab it is at, but uh, Lawrence Livermore has a slightly slower version called Sierra. Okay, so that probably gives you a better idea of, well, somewhat better idea of how Things need to be different. You have to program in a different way. You have to start thinking in a different way. You have to make sure you squeeze out every uh, possible flop from the CPUs. Flop, flop is a floating uh, floating point operations per sec flops. Okay. Um, so that's where I'm. Yeah. Uh, do you know how much petaflops they uh, achieved in Summit? Yeah, in Summit, they claim to achieve 200 petaflops. Wow. Uh, and this one, the Sierra computer, 128 petaflops. Um, Pita, Pita is 10 to 15, right? Okay, so that's 200 into 10 to times 15 operations per second. That's how many. Uh, calculations it can do. How many trillion is that? How many in a trillion? 10 to the 9? 10 to the 6 is million. Billion is 10 to the 9. Trillion is 10 to the 12. What comes after a trillion? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so it's, it's 200,000 trillion operations per second if you use the whole machine. So that's immense, but you also need to be able to code very efficiently to extract all that raw power. And most of the codes that we engineers write, it, it can utilize about 4% of that raw power. Okay. If it's a very nice code written by an engineer, it utilizes 10% of the uh, whole uh, machine that is available. It's called the theoretical heap, okay? And uh, if you have very smart computer scientists, they can actually optimize your code so that uh, it can extract up to 80, 90% of the CPU power, but that's unheard of. So uh, the group that I was working at before, they actually managed to do this. And they won several prizes for that. It's really unheard of to work at 80% efficiency. And this is the Swiss supercomputer. Each uh, rack, so these are called racks, each rack has several slots where you put in a whole uh, motherboard. Okay. And uh, so this can, for instance, have 10 to 15 slots. And each motherboard has between 18 to 36 CPUs. So you can imagine how uh, just this this, 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 this many racks can house thousands of different CPUs. Okay. Uh, if you remember, I showed you this simulation that we worked on, on that actual machine, a Swiss supercomputer. 
and this ran for four days on almost 3,000 CPUs, uh, probably more. Uh, so they, these look very intuitive, they make sense, but they are very, very difficult to uh, produce. They generate a huge amount of data which you have to know uh, how to handle correctly. So each, uh, it's, it's made up of several frames, right? We're playing almost 14 frames per second. Uh, so it's made up of how many frames in SD? Zero, two, 30 seconds? Mm -hmm. So it's made up of almost 600 to 900 frames. And each of those frames uh, corresponds to 20 gigabytes of data, or gigabytes of data. So that just tells you how, how difficult all of this is. Questions? If you have how many if you uh, how many CPUs has a HPC at FAU? I don't know. HPC at FAU, uh, I don't know the hard numbers. Um, some of you work with HPC, FAU. Uh, I come to FAU today, All right. Uh, do you remember the number of nodes roughly? It's twenty. It was yeah. eighteen I, last year. I checked. It was eighteen. Okay, so the total number of these slots, motherboards, is eighteen. Each of them should have. On average, 15 CPUs per motherboard. Mm -hmm. So that gives you an idea of how many uh, CPUs in total. So it should be roughly 15 times 20. So 300. 300. So it's a relatively modest touch. Um, the uh, supercomputers where this simulation ran, that's like a Swiss computer. So everybody in Switzerland uh, competes for getting time on the supercomputer, and then you can run your simulations there. The same thing happens for the Department of Energy supercomputer, so Summit or Sierra. These also, you have to compete for, for getting time on the computers, and then you can run your codes there. And if your simulation needs thousands of codes, that's what you should do. Okay, more questions? Can we have access to this uh, type of uh uh, super HPCs other, other than FAU? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, that's exactly why these supercomputers exist. Uh, so that people at universities can write proposals and ask for compute time. And uh, anybody can submit. And if you get accepted, you get time. Okay. And there's several. There's Department of Energy computers, NSF computers, Department of Defense computers. Uh, most are government funded. I don't know any private computers open to academics. Okay. So again, I'm telling you these things just to give you an overview. We are not going to go into details on any of this. Uh, how parallel programming works, how what message passing interfaces. If you want to know, again, come talk to me. Very happy to do that. But for the class, we won't do that. Okay. Uh, more questions? Mm, by the way, you can run just 400. You can use just 480 cores uh, in 168 hours for one job, maximum. So on the FAU supercomputer, you can use up to 480 cores um, CPU. 24 nodes. Okay, 20, 24 nodes in total. Uh, with, with 12 12 CPUs per node. Uh, yeah. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. Okay. Um, so fine. 480 seems like a good number. So instead of running my 3004 simulation for four days, I can run it on 400 CPUs for um, how many? 40 days. Okay. Um, Make sense? But there's a time restriction too. There's a time restriction. Yeah, but those are details, right? Those are, no, yeah, so we're talking about science, not administration. So scientifically, it should be possible to just take this and run it on 10 times fewer cores for 10 times longer. Makes sense, right? But that's not always the case because if you remember, one of the biggest limitations of these uh, high resolution simulations is memory. 
So uh, you need a tremendous amount of RAM to just be able to fit into the, fit your data into the computer. And if you exceed the memory available on the motherboard, you have to keep dividing until you can fit. Right. So there's a chance that this problem that was divided up into 3,000 different parts would not fit if I just divided up into 300 parts. Because each individual chunk would be 10 times larger. Make sense? So that's another issue where there is no option but to go to the supercomputer. Because again, memory is very expensive. Uh, it's the, the, the one component of a computer that has made the least progress um, with time. More questions? But it's also, I mean, number of elements you are using also is also important. Number of elements you are using is important and it's governed by physics. Yes. So if I want to do this high resolution simulation and I want to be able to do it at high fidelity, that tells me you need to use at least these many grid points. Okay. And that determines what the size of each chunk will be. I cannot use low, a fewer grid points because then my simulation is not accurate. Is there any approximation for the maximum? For the maximum what? Maximum number of processors or CPUs you are using. There is no limit, theoretical limit, on the maximum number of CPUs you can use. But there's something called scaling. Um, so scaling is how fast your, how much your code speeds up if you go from doing everything on one core to two cores. One CPU to two CPUs. The answer is it should be two times faster. Is that reality? No, it's no. never the case. Uh, you will be faster, but not exactly two times faster. So uh, if I use uh, 100 cores, 100 CPUs instead of one, I will not be 100 times faster. If I'm lucky, I will be 30 times faster, 40 times faster. So if you can keep increasing the number of CPUs you use, but the speed up you get will eventually die down. Mm -hmm. So there will be not too much of an advantage of keeping, uh, if you keep chopping up your problem into smaller chunks. Sometimes it can actually drop down. The speed up goes up initially, and then it slows down. Do you know why? It happened to me. I do not look at the what? problem. What? It happened to me, but I do not look at the problem. Okay, so if you don't look at the problem, how do you fix the problem? I do not care. <laughs> I wasn't paying for HPC, I was just using it. <laughs> um, so, it, it, sometimes it can happen that if you go from 1 to 100 nodes, 100 CPUs, your speed up is 40 times compared to running on just a single one. But if you go to 200 CPUs, your speed up compared to running on a single load might just be 25 times or 20 times. Mm -hmm. So now you start losing by throwing more resources at it. Because the connection is increasing and yeah. it's waste of time actually between two, three computers or 40 computers. Yeah, exactly. So each of these chunks that you have divided up your, your problem into, they have to talk to each other. And if there's too many of them, there's a lot of talking that needs to be done. And this is the slowest part of parallel computing. Uh, the, com the mathematics, the number crunching itself is relatively fast, but communicating across different motherboards is very, very slow. Okay. So there's always a trade-off. You cannot just divide your problem into as many parts as you want and expect a huge speed up. So uh, that's why there's whole people spend their lifetimes trying to fix these issues. This, this is a whole different area of research uh, because it's necessary and it's, you need specialists for that. Uh, okay, uh, let me show you another simulation. This is from the Los Alamos lab and this was, this is a very nice simulation of NASA is currently tracking 1,717 
near-Earth objects that are considered potentially hazardous asteroids due to their size and orbits. Approximately 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by oceans, so an asteroid is most likely to impact the water. An ocean impact within 10 to 20 kilometers of a populated coastline would be devastating, causing severe flooding, destructive shock waves in the air, high temperatures, and hurricane force winds. The threat from an ocean impact far from land is more difficult to assess. In particular, we want to know if destructive waves created by an impact can travel long distances to populated shorelines. To understand these threats, NASA held the second international workshop on asteroid threat assessment, focusing on asteroid-generated tsunamis. As part of this effort, scientists from Los Alamos National Laboratory are using high-performance computing to investigate how an asteroid's kinetic energy is transferred to the atmosphere and ocean. Los Alamos scientists ran an ensemble of 3D simulations, varying the asteroid's size, the angle of impact, and whether or not the asteroid exploded in an airburst before impact. The height of this airburst was also varied. We used X-RAGE, a parallel multi-physics Eulerian hydrodynamics code. X-RAGE uses adaptive mesh refinement to continually subdivide computational cells in important areas, applying more computing power to where it's needed. Our simulations contain three materials, a basalt asteroid, static air, and static water. Initially, all kinetic energy is assigned to the asteroid. By studying different runs from the ensemble, we see the effects of varying asteroid size, angle of impact, and airburst. Here, a light-colored pressure wave shows the asteroid's effect on the atmosphere. In addition, a large plume of water rises from the largest asteroid impact. Clearly, more kinetic energy is transferred to the water in this simulation. Slicing through the data set reveals more detail. The largest impact simulation shows development of a transient crater and a large plume of water and water vapor. Here we see two cases varying asteroid size. On the right are plots showing the transfer of kinetic energy from the asteroid to the water and air. Pressure waves in both the air and water show differences in the transfer of kinetic energy. Colliding shock waves in the atmosphere and water, as well as the wind at the water's surface, hinder the creation of a propagating wave. Here we see the difference in energy transfer with and without an airburst. Whether or not there is an airburst changes how much kinetic energy is transferred to the air and water. An airburst breaks the asteroid apart so that much of it skims the surface of the water rather than slamming into it. For the same size of asteroid, this results in a much smaller effect on the ocean. Interestingly, there is a stronger wave interference in the direct impact simulation, but such an impact is more likely to create a tsunami because of the greater height of the splash. This may indicate that a tsunami is more likely to be formed during a direct impact than an airburst. Previous simulations had led us to believe that the opposite was true. A feature discovered through this visualization is a pressure enhancement uprange of airburst impacts. Two pressure waves combine to create this, one from the asteroid in its trajectory and one from the explosion when the asteroid material hits the water. This may affect wave propagation and will have to be studied. By visualizing just the water in an impact simulation, we can study the formation of the tsunami wave. Immediately upon impact, a transient crater is created and a splash curtain is thrown high into the air. Water rushes into the crater, forming a water jet, which can be several kilometers high. This jet collapses to form a rim wave, which is hundreds of meters high. A new water jet begins to form, which will in turn create a new rim wave, a process that continues for some time. Each of these rim waves has the potential to become a tsunami. A threat of equal importance is the plume of water and water vapor that is lofted into the atmosphere. A large fraction of the asteroid's kinetic energy goes into vaporizing water to create the transient crater. Much of the water vapor is lofted into the stratosphere, where it may linger for months to years. Because water vapor is a potent greenhouse gas, this may have significant effects on climate. It is critical to understand the quantity and behavior of this vapor in order to assess the threat it poses. Analysis and visualization of this ensemble of X-ray simulations is already bringing us new insights into the science of asteroid ocean impact. These visualizations provide new insights and help Los Alamos scientists communicate. Okay, so you can already get a sense of how much data I need. Are using high performance over there. So each run is on the order of terabytes. Uh, 50, 86 terabytes it will be the largest run. And handling this much data is 
a whole field in itself. Okay. Um, these simulations look very, very fancy, but everything we have been learning is actually what everything is built up using the tools that we have been learning. There's the solving the diffusion equation, solving convection, and there's some advanced techniques involved. There's flux limiters, other things. But it's all built up from the basic things that we learn. Okay. Uh, so next week we will actually start going more into solving the Navier-Stokes equations themselves. Uh, all right. So I mentioned that all of these problems require data decomposition, breaking up the problem into chunks. And this is what that looks like. Uh, if your full plate, this might be a plate where you're studying heat conduction. If the full plate looks like this, you break it up and make sure to give each independency beam an equal amount of work. That's called load balancing. If you don't do that, then it becomes very inefficient because three of them will work very quickly and the slowest one will take much longer and everybody has to wait for the slowest one. Okay. Uh, let me see how much of this we should go into. Any questions? These are just some slides which I took from this book. Um, yeah, you can download them yourself from this website. Any questions before that? Um, if you do decide that, yeah, you really like the idea of parallel computing, there's many, many places you can use these skills at. Uh, national labs work on these problems. This, the asteroid impact problem is one example. Uh, any data crunching application has to deal with these problems, whether you work at Facebook, Microsoft, Google, or you work at a, an R&D firm that's looking at how to design better medicines. You have to use parallel computing. Uh, or you decide to join the weather forecasting service. You have to use parallel computing. Or you decide to earn a lot of money on stock markets. Uh, there are also people who try to you know, beat their competitors by relying on parallel computing. So no matter where you go, these skills come in very handy. Okay. So let's quickly take a look at what these slides say. Um, so that's what we were talking about early on. The increase in computational power was very, very significant. Almost. 50% uh, every year, but now it's much slower. Um, so uh, that's why we have seen this development of putting multiple CPUs on a single chip. Okay. And we also looked at some issues where uh, how, how do you program, how do you write your programs to be able to uh, harness these multiple CPUs? Okay. Uh, let's see, we can skip that. Ah, that. So, as we saw, there's many applications. We, we looked at one animation in the first video where they were trying to simulate what, uh, how weather patterns evolve. And all of the weather forecasting that we get on the news is based on these very uh, highly parallelized computations. And that's why they tend to not work very well very far into the future because they're very reliant on models that you put in. And these models are not very accurate. They can give you good results for up to three, four days. But beyond that, if you try to find weather forecast for two weeks from now, three weeks from now, it's almost impossible to do because uh, very small changes can alter the evolution of weather patterns very significantly. So if, you, if you're trying to do DNA sequencing, that's another place where computers were used very heavily. Um, drug discovery, we already mentioned this. You're trying to computationally determine what would be the best drug to target a particular type of cancer. Um, by targeting the genome of the cancer cell, 
computation is one way to go. If you run experiments, you might have to do hundreds or millions of experiments. Computationally, you can do this much cheaper, provided that you can write good models. Uh, it's also used a lot in energy research. We saw that the Department of Energy has the fastest computer now. Um, one of the big areas is uh, our nuclear stockpiles that were created in the 70s and 80s, are they safe to store for this long? Uh, there's no way to know, except to observe them or to run simulations of how they might have changed. And yeah, data analysis. Anywhere and everywhere you look today, there's data. So analyzing this data very efficiently is a, a requirement. Okay. Uh, is that right? I don't like these slides too much. Okay, so the reason uh, we're seeing a slowdown in, in computations is because the focus has always been to make the chips smaller, smaller, right? So if you make the transistor smaller, you can fit more and more on a single chip. Okay. Uh, but eventually, what happened was the transistors became so small that you get strange physics. Okay. That's out of my realm. It's, it's quantum behavior and other things. So at very small scales, things don't behave the way we expect them to behave. So there's those effects. And also, when you make these things very, very small, they tend to become very, very power hungry. Okay? And they can actually heat up significantly. You've probably noticed that your laptop heats up very, very significantly, especially when the fan is not on. And um, the average temperature of the CPU inside here would be on the order of 50 degree centigrade, 50 to 60 degree centigrade. Uh, in Fahrenheit, that is um, that is um, 1900, on the order of 100 Fahrenheit, maybe more, more, more than 100 Fahrenheit. Okay. Um, so yeah, the fans are necessary to cool them. Um, if you don't. The CPUs, the silicon chips, can actually start melting. And I was telling you about the work that my old group did, right? They had very smart computer scientists. So they managed to run their code so fast that they were actually damaging the, uh, the chips on these supercomputers. Because the supercomputer hardware manufacturers did not expect any codes to run this fast. So they did not provide sufficient cooling. And yeah, so everybody was amazed, like, wow, why do the, does the hardware crash when you run your code? And then they realize, oh, okay, we're actually melting our CPUs. So that can happen. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, skip, skip, skip. Okay. Yeah. This is a very dumbed down example of what parallel computing is. If I am Professor B, I have to create 300 exams with 15 questions. I have three CPUs here, and you can divide up the work by giving each of them one word. Okay? This is called data parallelism. You break up your data and give equal amounts of data to each of them. Now, this is where load balancing, the concept of load balancing becomes clear. If I give this TA 200 exams and the others, the rest of them, the time they will take to finish all of the grading will depend on this guy. So then you have to make sure that you don't overload one of the CPUs uh, much more than the others, because that will affect your whole computation. These will finish their task, but the full simulation is not finished. We are waiting for that. Okay, this is called data parallelism. Another way to divide up work is task parallelism, where every CPU works on a part of the data, but it goes through all of the 100 different data sets. Okay. Again, these are minor differences, just good to keep in mind. So load balancing is a big issue. That's the, what we are talking about. Make sure that everyone gets the same amount of work. Communication is the biggest bottleneck. So talking between two CPUs takes a lot of time. Okay. It's much, much slower, at least 10 times slower than computing numbers. I'm probably underestimating it's much or maybe 50 times slower. Okay. But it's necessary to communicate. You cannot just do
do things independently. Because what happens in one chunk affects what happens in the other chunk. Okay. All right. These are the two different types of parallel computing. One is shared memory. So if I have a problem I want to solve in parallel on my laptop, everything is stored in RAM here. Okay. So all of the individual cores, the CPUs, can access the data directly. But if I connect my laptop to your laptop and to your laptop, okay, the data has to be communicated. So that's what this that's what this where this network comes into play. Memory, data stored in memory zero has to go to memory one, has to go to other memory locations. And this is the slowest part, the network. That's called distributed memory computing. And high performance computing is done this way. There's no way you can have a single CPU be large enough to fit the large problems. Okay, uh, so, all right. Now, let's, uh, do you have any questions about parallel computing, supercomputing, anything in general, or polynomial theory? Again, we will not go into the details of how should we write parallel code. It's just good for you to know. That once you're comfortable with serial coding, there's something else to uh, continue developing your skills. So that's most of the leftover things that I wanted to finish. And I actually wanted to stop early today. So we will pick up the full navies how to solve the full Navier-Stokes equation starting from next week. We already know how to solve the diffusion part. We already know how to do the infection. And uh, we will look at how to do the pressure. And then how does all of this combine together to solve fluid flow problem. Uh, I will put up homework two today. Um, the project one is due today. So please don't forget that. Okay. And uh, if you have questions, again, email. Sound good? All right. at the same time working full time. So. Oh. Oh. Yeah, so we'll need to And so maybe we might have known him. Oh yeah? Yep. Did he graduate at you undergrad? He did, yeah. We'll see. Okay. We will uh, see him. Matthew oh, Lawrence. 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 Yeah Lawrence. Yeah. Yeah, we know him. We know him.
your hand mine in early. Maybe what we want to um, also talk about our touch panel. With our touch panel, you, know, you have your advanced features and stuff like that, so we can go through that together. Mm -hmm. Your document camera, your cable cubby with all your laptop accommodations, uh, your symposium with uh, you know, writing capability. Mm -hmm. From here, you got your computer. Mm -hmm. With the computer, for the most part. You log on with your Document camera, you might want to show them down position. I don't want to touch anything. Put a dot camera under a t shirt. That's the Table cubbies, you know, you have your cubby, you do a video, you open it up, and you can say HDMI, VGA. Yeah. The wireless mics, too. Yeah, do your wireless mics, how to use them. Make sure you pick them up. If you want to show, please replace your microphone. <laughs> test, test, test. Testing, testing, test, test, test. Normally they work, but the other big thing is to make sure you show them how to put them back so that they remain charged. Mm -hmm. There it is. Because if not, we'll have uh, professors call to complain that the mics are dead. <laughs> And so uh, that's the gear in this room. I mean, video conferencing piece, we would want to show them all that stuff. Just the equipment in the room that we can use. Yeah, because yeah, the recordings are automated and all. Right, exactly. So you don't need to. Would be cool. Just thinking from my standpoint, doing the document. So it might be just easier to get yeah, at this point in time it's just an idea that we want to expand on for sure if I want to cap we can always capture an image of this through um, Show that stuff. Mm -hmm. So then you can get a good full picture of what the touch screen looks like. But you can come in and take a picture of the your your take a picture of the entire desk. Mm -hmm. And then if anything you can zoom in on. Oh for sure. So yeah. you can zoom in on your cable cubby, you can zoom in on your 
We will have mm -hmm. you can zoom in on this. So yeah. So yeah. do you no, it'll be nice to capture this while I interact with it. So it's like you, know, you can touch this, it's fine. Yeah. And then the thing <laughs> is, yeah. Well, you can take a picture out here, but mm -hmm. then if anything you can zoom in and then mm -hmm. what you can do is through our tw uh, through fusion, you can we have the, the e control. We can mm -hmm. actually capture all that on, let's say you're using Camtasia or something, like that, you can actually capture that while you're on the computer. Yeah. So you wouldn't have to film that part, and then you can show, you know, going mm -hmm. between your yeah. different touch panels. Yeah. 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 I'll, um, I'll write up the, the pieces here and everything. Is uh, there air media in this classroom? Is there, is there what? Is there air media? Uh, air. Yeah. Yeah? Oh. Mobile. Yeah, whatever you can work on. Technology in the classroom. 